Hello, I'm Doug, stand-up physicist. Today I'm going to discuss research papers in peer-reviewed journals, because I've tried to get my own work in such a publication. And so I'm going to first go over what I think is necessary to do this process, since I think most people who uh, view videos on YouTube probably haven't tried to get something published in a peer review uh, journal. And I'll go through my own experiences with my unified standard model proposal. And just to give you a heads up, I took three swings of the bat and uh, <laughs> I struck out. But we'll go through those strikeouts because they are informative in and of themselves. So to write in science, I think it's first important to read science. And I'm not talking about the sort of general articles. I'm talking about, or general television shows, you really have to read the journals. And this is difficult to do. When I was a molecular biologist uh, several decades ago, I read the top flight journals every week. That would be Nature, Science, and once a month I think it's uh, Cell Comes Out. And after you do that for a number of years, you start to see how they present themselves, how they you know, spell out the, the story they're trying to tell. And you start to acquire the language. And there's no other way to really acquire the language except by reading it. And a lot of that stuff is pretty dry. I mean, they don't put any jokes in there. They're putting in a little color sometimes, but it is hard work because they often need to use jargon to condense what would be otherwise really, really, really long. And that's true in molecular biology, that's true in theoretical physics, that's true in all areas of science. You really have to learn the field very well and probably be a, either in a PhD program or have graduated before you stand any chance whatsoever of publishing your work. Of course, that's another problem. You have to come up with something worth talking about. <laughs> that is its own unique challenge. And to get in the very best papers, everybody else must think that what you just did was interesting. And that requires both a lot of work and a good amount of luck. So I've been working on this new approach to gravity and trying to see how I can integrate it with everything else. And I think I've gotten to a point where things are pretty interesting. But I have not put in that investment I said was required of reading current technical physics papers and therefore acquiring the language. Because, well, I'm not a full-time person. I'm working here uh, in my basement. <laughs> so I didn't match that basic uh, starting criteria. Why would I try and publish? Well, because people said, well, if you're this serious, in other words, I have an awful lot of actual math, then you should write uh, into a, a peer-reviewed journal. And the process of writing that was actually very good. It meant I couldn't slough off any points. I had to really go and find somebody who said something like this sort of thing. And it, it forced me to be a lot more careful than is, is my nature. <laughs> I much rather, you know, point with a big brush, uh, but a technical article, uh, you can't really do that. So it was a very good process. It took me four or five months because I kept on reviewing and reviewing and challenging, you know, subtle points here, looking for references, uh, mostly uh, uh, do, uh, experimentalist sort of stuff. And then I had something 
at the end of that long a period of time that I felt was worthy of peer review. So the question then become, well, which journal should I submit to? Since I don't read one, <laughs> I had to go on the title alone. So the title I went with is uh, Classical and Quantum Gravity. And because I'm using a green screen, uh, and this is green, it's probably going to disappear. Actually, let's look at the back here, okay? So the back of the journal doesn't have like a, a beer commercial, it's just what's in here. And what's in here, when I say I have trouble reading this, I, I have trouble even understanding, based on the title, what it's uh, really about. It, here we go. We've got high frequency quasi-normal modes for black holes with genetic singularity, generic, generic singularities too. <laughs> This is the sequel, man. The, the first one made so much money that they had to bring this out. Asymptotically non-flat space-times. No idea what they really are going to be getting at in that paper. And I've actually looked through every one of these, I don't know, maybe 22 different articles. I don't get any of them. So it doesn't make too much sense to publish here, but, I mean, my theory is very much kind of classical in a way and really does open the door to quantum mechanics because its, it, it, its structure is much easier or simpler uh, than, than general relativity. So you can do this all online. I, I didn't have to go to England and uh, drop it off at their door. I suppose I could have used the mail anyway, but it's all electronic. I mean this internet thing is was all designed initially so that physicists could communicate with each other rapidly. And their journals are like that too. You just had to put it in a the proper form, which is called LaTeX. And if you ever want to do that, then you need to find a program called LYX, LIX, because that will help an amateur make something that looks professional without having to learn all of LaTeX, which is its own nightmare. So after five months of effort, this is what I got. There's the title. Okay, a family of variations of the Maxwell action using quaternions and hypercomplex numbers contains the symmetries of the standard model and a testable gravity theory. Woohoo! Okay, so what did that mean? <laughs> I'm going to parse uh, the title so that you can have an impression of what might be inside. So the most important little two words in there is the Maxwell action. So what is the Maxwell action? Well the Maxwell part indicates that this has to do with how light works. And what an action is, is an integration over all of space-time of every single way that energy can be traded inside a unit volume. Notice I said just volume, not volume time. So if you, an integration means you add things up in a fancy calculus way, okay? So if you add things up over volume, over space and time, then let's say you integrate things over a short period of time. And then you do it again for like a million years. <laughs> Won't you get a different answer? And the answer is yes, you will get a very different answer if you integrate over different amounts of time. So why does anybody care about this action thing? Well, because what they do is actually variations of the action. And the game is to vary the action in such a way that the integral doesn't change. So that if you change something, the integral remains the same. So let me give you a concrete example. With the Maxwell action, you can say, well, I'm going to go in there with some angles, okay? And I'm going to twist things around. Tell me what happens. Well, when you do that, 
and you integrate over one second, well, nothing actually changes. And if you go out to like a million years, you know, you had your million years with one set of angles, and you had your million year uh, summation at a different angle, and you end up at exactly the same number. So what that tells you is that you have a symmetry of the action. The action doesn't care, like at all, about angles. And because the action does not care about angle, uh, angles, it means that angular momentum is conserved. So the big hunt with actions is to find the symmetries and therefore the conserved quantities. Now, the Maxwell action happens to be part of the very best field theory in all of physics. So the first kind of, the way it's this paper title starts out, a family of variations. Okay, so I am exploring space, the kind of math space, as it were, of the very best field theory there is. I mean, that sounds pretty rock solid. The problem comes in in the next little bit where I said using quaternions and hypercomplex numbers. It's because if you're a professional physicist and been reading all these technical papers, quaternions don't come up. Well, maybe once in a blue moon. And hypercomplex? <laughs> There's this one guy, uh, Clyde Davenport, who's got a Comcast address indicating that he's not at a major in institution, and he seems to be about the only guy who cares about hypercomplex numbers who's, like, not dead. So, I've got quaternions, which, like, people really don't care very much about, and hypercomplex numbers, which, which completely, absolutely no one cares about. I mean, talk about Mr. Un Unpopularity. Uh, that's, that's what that clause does for me, unfortunately. So, I, that's just the, the nature of the paper. That's how I did something new, <laughs> right? I mean, if that's a struggle, why don't you use the kind of numbers that nobody gets near? That's a good idea. Good strategy. Unless, of course, you want to get it published. <laughs> okay. But what I'm trying to do is get the symmetries, remember actions and symmetries, those are important connections, of the standard model. So what's the standard model? The standard model describes the three out of the four fundamental forces in nature. The, the forces would be the force of light, electromagnetism, the weak force, which has to do with radiation decay, and the strong force, which keeps nuclei together. So I use a super unpopular math to put in the symmetries that are fundamental to how forces work. That sounds pretty good, I think. <laughs> and then I finish it off with an attestable gravity theory. Now, light should be going off at this point for anybody reading this, because there are not very many testable gravity theories out there. There's general relativity that has passed every test that people have put to it. And then there are a bunch of different theories, none of which have passed all the tests. <laughs> so it's big news if you have a new one that might be consistent with all the old tests, and yet have one that if you push it a little beyond where we've gone today, might distinguish itself from general relativity. Because right now, it really appears like everybody, in order to justify that they're good and wonderful as a, as a theory, that they recreate general relativity. So they aren't any different. And if you're not any different, well, what's the point? I mean, science is about coming up with something new and testably different. General relativity was new and testably different from Newton's theory of gravity. And all you had to do was measure light bending around the sun. And 
if my claim is true, do the same darn experiment and compare my theory with general relativity. Just go and do it. Well, I should talk about the one little problem in the way, and that is that you have to be literally a million times more sensitive in the light bending around the sun experiment. And <laughs> that's not easy to come by. We're at like the 10,000 times better than it was in Einstein's day, but I got to get to a million. And then when I, once you get to the million, it's only 6% more bending, <laughs> which is not much. And people coming up with mo models for the, the sun saying, oh, it's got this kind of quadrupole moment, you know, they could probably drown it out. So it's important conceptually, conceptually, that I don't predict the same thing as general relativity, but it's going to be a darn difficult experiment to do. So now I have the title and the paper itself is about, I don't know, uh, 25 pages long. And what do I do but go to the internet and submit it to some journal. And the journal I chose was none other than classical and quantum gravity. And I submitted it to them online with my figures all zipped up in one file. And about two weeks later, I got their, their reply. So let's go uh, grab a hold of that because I want to uh, read you verbatim what they said. This paper proposes a quaternionic action principle unifying the electromagnetic weak and strong forces with the gravitational force. Excellent spot on summary there. I found it quite interesting. Totally rock on, man. I like it when somebody finds it interesting. Comma. But I fear that the radical nature of this proposal may not be appealing to the great majority of our rather conservative readership. Bummer. You know that stuff about hyper-complex uh, numbers and quaternions? That's what got the vote down. I would recommend resubmission to a journal specializing in foundational matters, such as foundations of physics. Well, that was great, because this is like a positive suggestion. This is a line of action I should take. His response was not about the content in the paper. It was about his audience. So I said, that's a good piece of advice. I will follow it through with it. And I spent two more weeks reading and rereading, trying to, you know, tweak it up just a little bit more. And I submitted it to Foundations of Physics. And they wrote me back in about two weeks and they said, the foundational content of the manuscript is too weak and hence is outside the scope of this journal. So what's foundational content? That's things like going, I don't get what like uh, quantum mechanics means and here's my own interpretation of what it all means kind of stuff. It's those kinds of debates that people can go on in a bar if they're physicists for like days. And what I did was I used the Maxwell action, which is like, so standard, it's boring. It's, it, it, the action doesn't really show up in this kind of discussion because it's, it's too standard. I, I wasn't radical. The author should try to do a better job positioning his work within modern physics and in a way, and in what way it advances other theories. Oh. That's a problem because I'm actually trying to knock other theories down on their butt. <laughs> I, I'm going head to head against general relativity and trying to say, hey, it was great while it lasted, but it isn't good enough because it doesn't connect with the rest of the stunned and bundle. 
That's my spin on it. Also, the author should refer to specific recent literature by other authors published in scientific journals on the foundations of physics which is relevant to this paper. Uh oh, I don't read recent literature. I'm going to have trouble with this one. Specifically, he should mention how his findings in this paper relate to or build upon that literature. Well, I actually did do that in a way. What I did was I said, look, I have a rank one field theory. And if you look through the literature for rank one field theories, I was able to find two papers, one in the early 50s, one in the early 60s. And they both said, rank one field theory not possible. <laughs> they didn't prove this, by the way. What they basically, I think, implied was rank one equals Maxwell. Maxwell has like charges repel. Gravity theory must have rank uh, like charges attract. Therefore, we're not even going to bother with the proof that a rank one proposal is just dumb. We'll just say, can't be done, and move on to other stuff. So what I did actually was, oh, of course, cite those, but then there's this guy named Clifford Will looks an awful lot like Ted Turner. It's amazing. But Ted Turner, no, Clifford Will is like the experimental test of gravity guy on the planet. He's just the best. He wrote an authoritative book on it, and he's got a living review article on all the different ways to test uh, gravity theories. And he's got this section three where he goes through all the possibilities, all the possible theories. And believe me, all kinds of varieties are in there, except a rank one field theory. So what I did was he came to MIT one time and they have these um, uh, get, get togethers before the talk that he was going to give to eat cookies, uh, to drink coffee, and possibly to talk to the person. And it turns out that nobody ever talks to the speaker. <laughs> They're like scared with them, scared of them, and they, they go and they, they talk to their friends. And since I had a specific question though, I broke that social convention. And he was definitely eating his cookies all by himself. And I approached him and I said, you know, I've got this argument with somebody on the internet and they said, hey, if you've got an alternative theory, Will would have mentioned it in his article. And I said, I read that article closely. It wasn't in there. So I want to ask you, <laughs> since you wrote it and you know it, was it in there or not? And he said, no, it wasn't in there. I said, well, and this guy, this guy's smart and knows his stuff. And he's like, well, and why? He said, because there was no reasonable rank one field theory. Okay, that's it. So I can't build upon the literature. If this guy who totally knows the literature, I mean, his book has several hundred references to everything that's going on. And anybody who wants to go and test in, uh, some theory is going to talk to this guy or, you know, at, at some point in their career. No, it, it just ain't there. And I, in fact, say uh, it ain't there according to personal communication with Clifford Will. So I did address this issue. But here's the thing, that these were rejections made by the editors. They didn't send it out for peer review. They were saying, will our audience be interested in this? They concluded that that, that was not the case. And there's no more discussion, okay? Their, their ruling is simply final. So I didn't like go and harass these guys and say, hey, come on, you pinhead. Hey, I probably shouldn't use the word pinhead anyway. But a polite word for pinhead, I should have said. 
if I was going to fight the editors, but there really isn't a mechanism for that. So I didn't. Um, but I did, th did think that, you know, if there was a mechanism, <laughs> I'm not saying there is and we're going to change the way, way uh, science is done. We're not. not. But if there was, the, what I would emphasize with the, was the final clause of the title. It's a testable gravity theory. And that's what trumps the other concerns. Because there are so few other testable gravity theories. And that's what should make it interesting to their readers. Now, it's not going to be an easy read because it involves those, those hard numbers, but, you know, that's the way it goes. So the, the first journal, Classical and Quantum Gravity, rejects this paper because it's too radical. That's because it's got the quaternions and hypercomplex numbers in the title. And the second journal, Foundations of uh, Physics, rejects it because it's too conservative. <laughs> it's variations of actions. That's not a foundational content issue. It's too standard. So what am I going to do? Well, what I decided to do, actually, was to get what I call an independent, impartial reviewer. That would be a program called Mathematica. Mathematica is miracle software because it can do the nastiest, hardest math faster than you can type out the kind of thing you want it to do. Actually, if it ever takes longer to type out than, uh, and come back with the answer, it probably means uh, you, <laughs> you typed in something bad. And this is completely impartial, uh, and so it is, it is incredibly thorough. You know, you, you, you can't get anything by this thing, this software. Fortunately for people who work uh, in their basement uh, research uh, facilities, They've lowered the price considerably. It used to be like $2,000 just to get your hands on this. Uh, but for home use on one computer, uh, they've lowered it down to 300 bucks. And so anybody who's just kind of hoping to figure out something deep in physics, uh, but doesn't have the real degree and isn't really involved in a program, I highly, highly recommend you shell out the money here because it's easy to fool yourself, okay? And Mathematica ends up being kind of a math proofreader of incredible skill. And it took me two months to take my paper and make sure that every single equation was spot on. Uh, because one of them wasn't. <laughs> one of them? I put it in, and it came out with a result, and it wasn't what I was expecting. And I was like, how did I mess this up? Because I don't think Mathematica is messing it up. I think it's doing exactly what I asked it to do, and yet it doesn't look right. And I spent a weekend worrying about this, and I actually realized what was my error in writing the expression. I made this one little change, and it changed one, the one little equation, and it also gave me a lot of faith that what I'm doing is very rigorous. All right? So then, I, because I'm subscribed to a whole bunch of different physics email kind of lists and whatnot, um, this guy fighting out of Mexico um, sends me this note saying, wow, well, we want to do all these things with gravity and the standard model, and I'm going to hopefully publish a book with uh, these peer review uh, articles in it. And I was like, wow, that's perfect. I'll submit it to him. So I did, and I got this back uh, a couple weeks ago. No, a week ago.
Speaking sincerely, I am much disappointed by the content and the level of the paper, both mathematically, introducing a lot of different multiplications, ungrounded or undefined operations, and the physical one. Ooh. <laughs> we aren't going to win this guy over, okay? Uh, now, this would be very bad if it was true, okay? That I was, like, making up symbols that nobody else used. Well, actually, I did have a symbol that nobody else used. And what I did was because nobody else uses hyper-complex numbers, okay? And you somehow had to symbolize that. And so I said, if you unfamiliar with quaternions and hyper-complex numbers, read the appendix. So I provided an appendix which explained this box uh, times thing and an O times symbol there. And in fact, when I did the Mathematica notebook, of course, I had to define those things because otherwise <laughs> mathematically I couldn't do every single equation uh, in the paper. But it's pretty clear from that sentence that when I said, read the appendix, he didn't. <laughs> so, if you don't read the appendix and you come across one of those symbols, you're going to go, oh man, this, this guy's making up total, well, who knows? So, I consider this a kind of almost, almost a reading comprehension problem. But it... But what can I say? Go back and read the appendix? I don't think so. Particularly, I do not understand how one is able to construct a relativistically invariant action on the basis of the real quaternion algebra, whose symmetry groups are SO3 or SO4. Now, this is one of those things that's both true and irrelevant. At least that last thing about quaternions being involved in the groups SO3, which is rotations in three dimensions, and SO4, which is rotations in four dimensions. I say it's true but not relevant because I wasn't worried about rotations in three dimensions. I wasn't worried about rotations in four dimensions. I was worried about creating the Maxwell action, right in the title there. The Maxwell action is invariant under a Lorentz transformation. And in fact, it's actually easy for me to say it is E squared minus B squared, where E squared is the electric, uh, electric field density and the B is the magnetic field density. And it has to be these densities, right? Because it's all the way that an electric field can exchange energy in a unit volume. And it's minus the, all the ways that a magnetic field can be exchanged in a volume. And if you know the basics of the Maxwell actions, it's just one square minus the other. So very early on in this paper, I use my quaternions and I show how to get E squared minus B squared. Boom! I am done, okay, with that critique. I mean, SO3, SO4, not relevant. Getting E squared minus B squared as a scalar means that you have something that's invariant under a Lorentz transformation. I shouldn't have to explain this. This guy should know this. And he doesn't. Sad, sad, sad. Generally, I found nothing original or interesting in the author's constructions. Now, I must say, I've seen this kind of reaction before. If they don't get your math, they're just going to say there's nothing interesting. There's nothing original. Because they see nothing, right? That's it. They see nothing. So nothing is boring. And I am even in doubt if the article can be improved somehow. Sorry. Of course, my opinion is subjective. 
Oh, so I guess that's his defense on not knowing that e squared minus b squared is Lorentz invariant. Um, now, I, I, had a, I had to reply to this, uh, and uh, what I said was this. Hello, and I'm not going to use his name. I'll protect him uh, from the wrath of everyone watching this video. <laughs> you are free to have your own opinion. Mathematica can follow my, the logic. Sorry, my presentation failed to communicate with you. The notebook contains a derivation of the Maxwell equations. Pretty standard stuff, just done all with quaternions. All the expressions have been verified by a symbolic math program, but I cannot go against a bias about what quaternion algebra or hypercomplex algebras can or cannot do. So that was my polite reply. And did I have more negative stuff? Of course I did. <laughs> Actually, when I got his uh, note back, my hands started shaking, and that's actually an adrenaline reaction. Uh, you know, that whole fight or flight sort of thing. I, my system just got pumped with it because I thought he was like clearly wrong, and I wanted to fight him, and I knew I couldn't. I was lose. I, I, I was guaranteed it to to lose. Um, a lot of tension. Now, I compare that, actually, with what it was like to make the math no ma Mathematica notebook. I mean, that was just wonderful, okay? Because it confirmed in a nice, independent way that, well, I was spot on for all but one equation, and I was able to correct that one equation, and so that just totally rocked. And what I did with, with, that, with that thing is I sent it to a friend of mine who's actually communicating to me about this very technical stuff. And really, at this point, there's only one person on the planet <laughs> who's engaging in, in such a dialogue. We will use his first name, Lowell, and uh, otherwise leave, uh, leave, leave his name out. Um, and here was his reply uh, to that critique. Gee, it looks as though it's, quote-unquote, fuck you Friday all over again. That's because I have another video on here about a disagreement I had with uh, physics forums, um, but I'm going to go visit those guys again. Um, but anyway, there's another video uh, where that phrase uh, originated. So he's quoting uh, the critique. Generally, I found nothing original or interesting in the author's construction. You gotta be shitting me. In your defense, Doug, I've never seen a formulation of the full standard model in quaternions. And the hypercomplex products deal with weak field gravity, not original? <laughs> Both mathematical introduction of a lot of different multiplications, ungrounded or undefined operations, etc. Appendices, hello! <laughs> <laughs> you included a very nice and clear breakdown, upon my advice, uh, toot toot, of how quaternions and your particular notation relate to the work with tensors. I am not a specialist by the greatest measure in this field theory stuff, and I can still understand your work. Though you do come up with methods and idea, I must ponder for a while. His opinion is not subjective, it's retarded. <laughs> That's actually what I needed. Uh, more, than, I mean, uh, more than all the other stuff was a good way to laugh at, at this guy, okay? That, you know, that's why you have scientific friendships. Uh, that relieved a lot of the the, the tension I had, uh, the negative feelings I had toward this for for this this person. Um, I can live with the fact that he skipped the appendix, and once you skip the appendix, it, it's it's shot. It's a it's a no go. It, nothing's going to work. Okay. Um, 
I have used his comments to refine it a little bit to say, to point out, hey, I got E squared minus B squared people. The only way that can happen is if I get E and B and those both transform like second rank tensors. Uh, game is finished as far as there's, you can't complain about the, the properties of quaternions under Lorentz transformations because it's the bloody same exactly to every measure you could conceivably come up with to the tensor one. So that is now in my paper because of this rejection. So that rejection actually had a positive uh, effect on, on, on the paper itself. So where do I go from here? Oh, I'll just put it up on the internet, <laughs> on my own website, and I will probably hand out the Mathematica notebook uh, or reference to it to, to maybe famous physicists. But I think what's more likely to happen is that engineering types or maybe people who were in physics for a while, but they didn't make the, the absolute top cream of the crop uh, cutoff kind of thing, they'll be able to take the, the Mathematica notebook and kick it. I mean, and that's very important because most technical articles, uh, you just have to swallow it whole. <laughs> you can't go and play with it in any way. It, it's kind of like you don't have any way to confirm it other than say, well, it appeared in a peer-reviewed journal, so it's probably excellent. Look, I, I missed one conjugate operator and it was hard to, hard to pick out. Mathematica did it, okay. Uh, but I'm going to have this tool that other people can actually uh, download and, and play with it and say, is this reasonable? If I do, did he like fake it out in some way or another? You know, and I think that will appeal actually to the much larger pool of people who are darn good at physics, uh, but they, they're not working at the Advanced uh, Institute of uh, Study in Princeton or, you know, other, other high fancy kind of places. So the net story, the net result for me of writing the scientific paper was, was absolutely wonderful because I can now say, here it is in 25 pages, you know, the whole flow of it presented in a logical uh, order. And because I put it through Mathematica, I can actually be confident that it's worth somebody else's time. And uh, that's very valuable be, to give me the self-confidence that I'm not wasting other people's time with the work. Because you, you, you read that last review and you think, well, maybe I am. I, I mean, seriously, I, I say maybe I am wasting my own time, my own money in the basement. How do I know? Well, I do have one, one human <laughs> and one math, math program that says, if you decide to read this paper, it may just well be worth your time. I hope you get a chance uh, to investigate it further. Uh, thank you very much. All the girls in the classroom think he's hot. He shows up wearing the sandals with the white socks. He hears him giggling while he's got his back to the class. He thinks he's got an eraser mark on his ass. And all the girls from the hall show up to hear him talk. Even though most of the time he's covered in chalk. Math prop rock star. box uh, to try and actually make a point about that book on the outside there. Uh, what is it? Um, Subtle is the Lord by Abraham Pays. He said if he had to summarize Einstein's life in like just one sentence or less, 
<laughs> Maybe not or less, because that would be no sentences. All right, in one sentence, then, he would say, Einstein was the freest man he's ever known. And by that, he meant that he could do whatever he wanted to do scientifically. He spent, you know, 30 years trying to figure out how to get gravity along with uh, light. And he didn't care that nobody else cared. And he thought, thought a lot about quantum mechanics and why is it logically different. He was free to do that. And he was also free socially. Uh, perhaps the uh, most infamous was the fact that in his place in Princeton, he had a, a room where he would sometimes invite women who are not his wife to just come and hang out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, why do we say uh, they did what men and women in private rooms uh, often end up doing? As a matter of fact, the Russians at one point sent a spy specifically to go sleep with Einstein. Uh, she, she, she succeeded with that part of it. I don't know if she got out any information, but <laughs> Einstein probably got a good time out of it. Uh, so the man was... As, as uh, Pace said, uh, very free. I, uh, in contrast, I am so constrained. You can, you can see my glucose meter, which I didn't want to take inside this box here. Uh, on the outside there, um, that's hooked up to me 24-7, even when I do this silly skit. Uh, it, I can do nothing without somehow thinking or reflecting or being diabetic. And uh, my science, uh, <laughs> it's after midnight here uh, as I'm hanging out naked inside of a closed box. Uh, this is the time to work. <laughs> well, sometimes I work uh, from 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 a.m. Uh, but I don't get a lot of time uh, to work and I certainly don't get any assistance. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's tough. Okay, but I'm going to show, I'm going to try and do like a, a Houdini-like thing here. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, break out of this here box, okay? So, uh, you know, because this, this box is sealed by that piece of black duct tape, okay? And if you know anything about duct tape, it's really strong stuff, okay? So I'm just going to uh, really focus, focus all my energy, all my effort, and see if I can break out of this thing. Ugh. All right. <sighs> Woo! <laughs>